Um, differences between isometric and geometric, those is um, isomers. Mm, geometric requires a double bond yeah. for sure. Oops. So they're fixed, basically. That's what I got. This structural one. Um, They have actual physical different connections. The atoms are actually not connected to the same atoms in a structural isomer. But in a geometric isomer, the atoms are still connected to the same spot, right? So when we're looking at a double bond, and I've got, say, fluorines that are trans to each other, this fluorine that's right here is connected to this carbon, right? What happens when this goes trans? Or sorry, when it goes cis. Oh, it goes on the other side. It's the same. So it's still connected to the same carbon, right? In the structural isomers, they're physically connected to different things. And in the, in the geometric isomer, they're connected to the same thing. It's just that they're stuck in their position and they can't rotate. So um, different connectivity, same connectivity, but uh, stuck in position, a geometric position. And again, that will only happen in a double bond, although we're going to talk about another isomer that's a little more, there's a little more to it later today. Uh, draw a name to structural isomers. Uh, there you go. So I got hexane. And I got three methyl Pentane. They have the same chemical formula, right? But they have different structural formulas. So, w yeah, let's back up a sec. What about the, is there a difference in the chemical formula for a geometric isomer? Nope. There's no difference in chemical formulas for the isomers whatsoever. It's always, the formulas are going to be the same, which is why we're going to get further and further away from chemical formulas because they turn out to be kind of useless, especially when we're talking about isomers. I have no idea if I throw up the chemical formula for, um, say, a trans fat. It's the exact same chemical formula it is for a cis fat. So the formula isn't helping me know if that particular chemical is going to be good for me or not. Um, on that logic, do you see why the labeling the labeling of food in the United States isn't super helpful. What things does it say on the label? That top part, it says, you know, number of number of servings. Yeah. Doesn't say that. It says carbohydrates and fats. Oh, yeah. Carbohydrates due to sugar, protein, but it just says fats. Is that helpful? Yeah. No. Is it a saturated fat? Is it an unsaturated fat? Is it a polyunsaturated fat? Is it an omega-3 fatty acid? Is it a fat that's a trans fat? Is it a fat that's a cis fat? Is it a fat that's bad for me? Is it a fat that's good for me? I don't know. It's a fat. It's not enough information. True. And the, there are several organizations that are trying to push the Food and Drug Administration to force companies to do that. But then... They're changing the label. The label is definitely changing. But they're, they're still in negotiations about how detailed they're going to make the... Um, each of those subcategories for the biological molecules. And so I seriously doubt you're going to get trans fat, cis fat ratios. Does anybody have any idea why they wouldn't just do that? Why wouldn't Kraft just write that on the box of macaroni and cheese? Yeah, exactly. Doesn't know what it means? Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't think that's their major goal. Well, that's, I'm sure that's not their major concern. What? No, no, I don't think that's going to be the issue. It's mostly about they got to figure it out. They don't actually know. They're just making stuff, right? Tastes good. People buy it. Good to go. So does that mean that every batch that comes off, somebody's going to have to do an analysis to tell me what percentage of the fat is trans fat, cis fat, saturated, unsaturated fats? That's not super cheap. It's got to happen. I mean, you might not think that that kind of stuff occurs, but every if you look at a box, the box itself looks identical to the box next to it, except there's going to be a number on it. 
report, it's a batch number. So they made a huge batch, like you would make a batch of chocolate chip cookies and then put them in a container and label it. I made these on, you know, four two. And then you make another batch a week later and now it's four nine. And so you're labeling your batches and the same thing happens with that. So if there's a food outbreak, food illness outbreak, they can track that batch back to see what might have been the problem. Um, so they do check that food constantly. Like there's a company in Goldendale that makes like one third of all the flavoring for Wrigley's gum, like the spearmint and the wintergreen and all that kind of stuff. They have these like 100 gallon carboys of oil. And every time they create one of those things at this company, they have, so there's a chemist there that does GC mass spec on it to tell you exactly what's in that. Because would you want to buy a pack of spearmint Wrigley's gum that tasted different than the pack that you bought before? They don't want it to, they want it to be exactly the same. So really it's about regulation and the amount of money that it would cost to do all that kind of stuff. You get charged more for your mac and cheese. Can't have that. Draw two geometric isomers. All right, we'll do a simple one. So a couple of carbons, and a fluorine and a fluorine and a hydrogen and a hydrogen. So there's my cis version and I've got a fluorine and a hydrogen and a fluorine and a carbon. So there's my trans version. And again, the chemical formula is obviously exactly the same. The structural formula is the same because structure just means the connectivity of things. The problem with this is that that double bond prevents rotation. And so those guys are f stuck in a fixed position. So geometrically, they're different from each other. And again, these are really different molecules. Because the fluorines are not on the same side or on the same side, that molecule becomes more or less chemically reactive. It might not seem like a big deal, but it actually is a really big deal. Draw out 3,4,4-trichloral-2,3-hexadiene. Identify the hybridization in the shape of all six carbons. All right, hexadiene. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Carbon number 1, carbon number 2. So there's a double bond there, and then there's a double bond there. And then 3, 4, 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Four trichloral, and so this thing right here. What's this first one? SP three, right? We okay with that? Mm -hmm. So this one is SP three, and this one right here, SP two. Um, this one on the end, SP three. This one here. SP3 and this one here and this one here you okay with that this molecule can't exist why there's too many bonds to carbon number three and carbon number four I just wanted to make sure that you recognize that you can see that and so you should have nothing there it should be like yeah sorry this whole molecule is a no way can't do that I think I have another one on here yep I have another one on here okay um, this first one what do you got for a name for the first one going on huh I don't know why that's moving but delete row Okay, so let's see, I've got a uh, 3-chloro, 2-methyl, two 2-pentene, two are we good with that? Sister trans, why not? 
Mm, not that there's only one chlorine. More importantly, that these things are the same. What is that about? Yeah. That carbon on the right side of the double bond has the same thing, right? It's a CH3 and a CH3. So if you flip their positions of those CH3s, would you change anything? No. OK, so this next one here, what do we got? It's like a cis one, two, three, comma, four, dimethyl. Um, two hexene. Are we good with that? So the cis would be the these two methyl groups cis to each other. Mm, name everything here. So that's going to be. Uh, Fluoroethane. This is going to be a carbon doubly bonded to a carp. Oh my god. A uh, carbon doubly bonded to a carbon with an H and an F and an H and an F. Do you need to put down that it's one ethene? There's only one double bond possibility. Um, how about one fluoro? There's only one thing on it. It's not important. Uh, okay, how about this last one here? Why can't you name it? Five bonds on the third carbon. Triply bonded to the one above, and then double bond or single bonded to the left and the right. So it's five bonds. No go. If you were going to name it, how would you name it? Since I can't draw on there, you would do this, right? Are we yeah. okay with that? Would be the structure. So I name this out one, two, three, four, five. So it would be a one pentine and a two ethyl, two ethyl one pentine. That would, I wrote. That would be the name if the molecule existed, but we can't have five carbons. Well, good job on that. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to draw this, and I don't think this is going to work for me, so I'm just going to delete these. Uh, carbon, carbon, chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen, hydrogen. Uh, two, three, four, five, six, and then double bond and a double bond. Um, something like that. And then uh, two, two, three, four triple bond and then a hitch BR. So this one's a little, you gotta make sure that there's one, two, three, and four carbons. And then there's a gotta be a line here that goes off to the bromine. <coughs> Don't, well, usually when a person uh, does this one, I, many times what we'll have is one, two, three, they'll draw four carbons. They'll put the triple bond here and then they'll just write a bromine at the end. What that would mean is this bromine, this is the bond to the bromine, and it's really only three carbons now. So the best thing to do is on an end, always draw like a half looking bond and then put the thing that you want to, to be there. Just saves you. So you should be able to, when you're finished with it, write a number one, a number two, a number three, and a number four down there. So you know that there are actually four carbons.